Hello everyone, my name is Euros Panayotakos and I'm going to talk about uh, block chains from an idealized hash function. This is joint work with Juan Garay and Agilos Keyas. Blockchain protocols are characterized by the fact that transactions are organized into blocks and blocks into chains. Now, this type of protocols was made popular with Bitcoin in 2008, which uses the structure to implement what is called a robust transaction ledger, a security notion developed through a series of papers that mainly satisfies two properties, consistency, that is everyone should eventually agree on the order of transactions, and liveness, that is anyone should be able to add a valid transaction in the ledger. Now, what's interesting about these protocols is that they can operate in what is called the permissionless setting. While in the classical setting, uh, parties register, for example, using a PKI, and then they can communicate uh, in an authenticated manner. In the permissionless setting, uh, participation is open, anyone can join the protocol, which also implies that parties communicate through some kind of uh, gossip protocol and communication is not authenticated. Obviously, this is a more challenging setting, uh, and top participation directly implies uh, that uh, we're open to civil attacks. A civil attack is an attack where the adversary creates many fake identities in order to overrepresent himself. And this is especially important because uh, classical protocols that can implement a ledger rely on the assumption that the majority of the parties is honest. Hence, uh, all these protocols uh, do not uh, work when uh, the adversary can launch a civil attack because by overrepresenting himself, he can essentially break the honest majority assumption. And the novelty of Bitcoin uh, to deal with this attack, which was adopted by many other protocols, was to try to make participation costly. Now, this is achieved by the use of proof of work. A proof of work is a proof that some computational work has been done in a specific time interval, a notion introduced by Dvorkin in 1992. And the main idea is that uh, is to use a proof of work uh, in each block. Now, this implies that the ability of the adversary to create new blocks is limited by its computational power. And proof of work based protocols take advantage of this by uh, operating under the assumption that the majority of computational power is controlled by honest parties. There have also been other approaches. Uh, for, for example, the use of proofs of space-time, which require uh, disk space. And I should note that, that in this discussion we do not uh, involve proofs of uh, protocols that use proofs of stake, because they require an initial registration phase. Now, most blockchain protocols uh, use hash-based proofs of work, and the same holds for uh, proofs of space-time. And as an example, I'll describe the construction used by Bitcoin. In this construction, parties uh, first receive a challenge string X, and they seek to find a witness consisting of two parts, uh, a message and a counter. And a proof of work of this type uh, is valid if hashing the challenge with a message and then hashing again with a counter produces a string that's smaller than some target T. Now, the way uh, these uh, protocols are analyzed uh, is using the random oracle methodology. This methodology dictates that we should replace uh, hash functions with a random oracle and then prove security. And it has been shown by Canetti, Goldreyer, and Halevi in 1998 uh, that the random oracle methodology is not sound and should only be used as a sanity check for our protocols. Hence, the question we pose here is whether we can base the security of uh, proof-of-work uh, blockchain protocols on a set of properties for own idealized hash functions. We answer this question in the affirmative. We design a blockchain protocol that's proven secure, assuming first the existence of a non-idealized hash function that satisfies a set of three simple properties. Secondly, the existence of uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs. And thirdly, that the adversary controls at most one third of the computational power. Now, in the process of doing that, we introduce the notion of iterated search problems. This is a class of search of hard problems uh, closely related to iterated sequential functions. With the difference being that at this iteration, uh, parties have to solve a search problem and not compute a function. 
What is also interesting here is that our notion allows for parallelization, unlike uh, sequential functions. And this property is uh, shown to be important for the design of uh, proof-of-work-based blockchain protocols. So next I'll present the three uh, hash, fun pro hash function properties we assume. The first one is collision resistance. This is a standard property about hash functions. The second one is that we assume that uh, the hash function is a computational weak randomness extractor. More specifically, we need that for any adversarial generated X, it should be hard for the adversary to distinguish between hashing X with a uniformly random string from a uniformly random string uh, that has the same uh, size as the hash output. Again, this is a standard assumption about hash functions. And finally, the third property that we introduce is t-iterated hardness. In a high level, this property says that it should be hard to generate a sequence of uh, small hashes. In more detail now, given uh, a string x that is randomly sampled, and for large enough k, any adversary that takes k times t steps uh, should generate a list of strings wi wi prime such that hashing the strings iteratively hashing the string starting from the challenge string x has the property that every second has is smaller than the target t with probability negligible in lambda the security parameter. Again, this property looks similar to iterated sequential functions, but the difference is that uh, at every iteration, the adversary has to find, has to solve a search problem instead of computing a function, has to find uh, strings wi wi prime instead of just computing a function. Uh, moreover, as I said, collision resistance and uh, being a weak extractor are standard properties about hash functions. So in this work, we also had to argue about what evidence we have about uh, the iterated hardness property. So to describe our approach, I'll first remind you of how we evaluate the security of real world hash function properties. Take, for example, Ketsek and collision resistance. The reason we believe that uh, Ketsak is collision resistant is because there was a competition run by NIST that incentivized uh, researchers to break this property. Now, since no serious attack was found uh, for the duration of this competition, uh, we consider Ketsak to uh, be collision resistant, or we consider that there is positive evidence for the collision resistance of Ketsak. Now take the case of SATA56 squared, the hash function used uh, by Bitcoin, and iterated hardness. In the next slides, I'll argue that uh, uh, breaking iterated hardness means also breaking Bitcoin. Hence, there was an incentive all these years that Bitcoin is run to uh, break this property. Moreover, for the last 10 years, no serious attack against this property has been uh, shown. Hence, we conclude that there is some positive evidence uh, towards the security of uh, the iterated hardness of SAT56 squared. It's important to say here that this uh, claim is non trivial, since this argument would not necessarily hold for stronger uh, hardness properties, because it may not be the case that breaking these properties means uh, breaking Bitcoin, which also creates the incentive to do the work. First, I'll give a brief description uh, of Bitcoin. Each block in Bitcoin contains a pointer to the previous block, a message and a counter. For the, for the block to contain a valid proof of work, it should be the case that hashing the pointer with the message and then hashing again with the counter uh, produces a, an output that's smaller than some target T. Now, the protocol dictates that parties uh, should pick the longest chain among the ones they have heard and try to uh, uh, extend it by computing a small, uh, another proof of work that uh, contains the message, the transactions they want to uh, add to the chain. And uh, a transaction is considered to be stable if, uh, if it is contained in a block that is at least k blocks deep uh, in the chain of the respective uh, party. So now we're in a position to argue that if uh, for some t uh, there exists an adversary that 
breaks T-traded harness, then there is an adversary that breaks the security of Bitcoin. So the uh, Bitcoin adversary is going to use the iterate harness adversary to break the security of Bitcoin. And the way he's going to do that is by uh, selecting the longest chain uh, at some point in the Bitcoin ex execution, uh, hashing its last block, B, in this image, and giving it as input to the iterate harness adversary who in turn is going to produce in less than k times t steps uh, a list of witnesses where hashing, uh, iteratively hashing these witnesses starting from uh, the hash of the last block has the property that every second hash is smaller than some target t which effectively means that each pair of these witnesses uh, is going to be a valid block extending b and on the other hand, uh, we can show that uh, honest parties in the same time interval uh, are not going to be able to generate as many blocks. Hence, uh, the adversary uh, can create a deep fork and force some parties, some honest parties, uh, force uh, honest parties to have different views about uh, which transactions are stable and effectively uh, break consistency. This is exactly what we wanted, as uh, breaking the red harness means breaking Bitcoin, which effectively means uh, creating an incentive to break this property. So next, I'll talk a bit about how we can implement a secure blockchain protocol uh, under the assumptions we just presented in the previous uh, section. So our first uh, naive attempt is to try to follow Bitcoin's design. The main problem with that is that uh, we have to bound the rate uh, that the adversary generates blocks uh, using the iterated harness assumption. Now the first issue is that uh, the adversary in the Bitcoin execution sees also honestly computed blocks. If you remember the iterated harness game, there the adversary does not get any help by any external uh, oracle, let's say, giving him small hashes. This kind of implies that in our solution we should be able to cheaply uh, generate, simulate uh, honest blocks. The second issue we have is that uh, iterated harness does not exclude the possibility that the proof of work of Bitcoin is witness malleable. While iterated harness ensures that it's hard to generate a sequence of blocks, it does not say anything about generating blocks at the same level, about generating small hashes at the same level. I'll just note here that uh, uh, in the case of the random oracle model, uh, we are sure we can prove that it's hard to generate also uh, small weaknesses at the same level. To deal with these issues, we choose to embrace proof of work weakness malleability. Similar techniques uh, have been applied to other cryptographic primitives, such as witness malleable commitments or witness malleable uh, NISCs. Essentially, we uh, allow malleability in a controlled way. So the first thing we do is uh, to, reverse, to, to reverse Bitcoin's proof of work design by requiring that uh, the first hash is smaller than, than uh, some target T instead of the second one. Note here that this uh, preserves uh, this um, property that every second hash is smaller than some target and will later help us uh, argue that hardness is preserved. The second change we do is that we uh, require that um, the, the witnesses are sampled uniformly at random. This has the effect that the, the, the second hash, the output of the second hash, is going to be computationally indistinguishable from uh, uniform due to the uh, weak extraction property of the hash. Finally note that uh, this proof of work we have constructed is explicitly witness malleable in the sense that you can create a new proof of work by changing uh, the second part of a witness. Of course, all this does not help us from the uh, issue mentioned before where the adversary uh, manages to compute a new block uh, cheaply because uh, he has seen an honest block at the same level. 
To address this issue, we choose to use an extractable NISC uh, scheme to hide witnesses. So we, we're going to replace witness strings, let's say W1, W1 prime, with some proof P1. This proof is going to guarantee that there exist uh, strings W1, W1 prime, such, has, such that hashing uh, X1 with W1 is smaller than uh, some target T. This uh, is to ensure hardness. Secondly, that hashing X1 with W1 and then hashing again with W1 prime, the second part of the witness, is equal to some string X2 that's going to be uh, part of the uh, block and publicly revealed. This uh, allows other parties to continue uh, mining on top of our, of our block uh, after publishing the block. Essentially, they're going to use X2. They're going to try to extend uh, X2. And finally, we're going to uh, attach a message. Uh, we're going to publicly reveal a message and ensure that uh, this uh, NISC proof is generated with respect to this message so that a unique message uh, is, al is always attached to a block. All these changes uh, have helped us in uh, being able to simply simulate a block. And we can do that because first we're able to simulate uh, the second hash, x2 in this case, uh, by just uh, randomly sampling a new string. And this string is going to be distinguishable from the actual hash uh, due to the uh, weak randomness extractor property. And secondly, because we can use the NISC simulator now to uh, simulate uh, the NISC proof of the block. So next, I'll give a brief outline of how all these changes help us uh, reduce an attacker against uh, Bitcoin to an attacker against the iterated hardness property. So assume you have an attacker that uh, generates blocks fast in the Bitcoin protocol. We're going to use it to uh, generate small hashes against the iterated hardness property. So assume now you have some, uh, you start some, some, from some block and at some point the adversary generates uh, a new block in the Bitcoin execution. Uh, time passes and then let's say some honest party is about to generate a new block. Uh, what we want is to be able to cheaply simulate uh, this block. So what we're going to do is the following. First, uh, extract uh, the witness of the desired block, W0, W0 prime. We can do that because the NISC is extractable. Then we're going to uh, sample a new witness by uh, uniformly sampling uh, the second string. Let's call it W0 star. And let now X2 be the, uh, the second hash for this new witness. Now notice that uh, what we've managed to do up to now is create two blocks or almost two blocks that are at the same level. Instead, what we wanted was to, com to, to, com to simulate a block that is uh, extending the adversarial one. So to do that, we're going to use the NISC simulator to create a proof that there exist strings W1, W1 prime says that uh, the if you has x1 with w1 and x uh, and the out and the result of that with w1 prime the result is uh, x2 uh, now we can show that the adversary cannot distinguish in between between the two cases in two cases cannot distinguish in between uh, generating uh, the honest block the way we did now and generating uh, the honest block as in the real execution. Now, if the adversary at some later point generates another desired block, we will be able to uh, extract a sequence of small hashes as the iterate hardness game uh, dictates. So we're going to extract the witness from the new block, W2, then W2 prime. And now X0, W0, W0 star, W2, W2 prime, constitute a sequence with two small hashes, as the iterated hardness game uh, dictates. So by continuing, continuing uh, this strategy, we can uh, generate uh, a long sequence of uh, 
of uh, small hashes, as the Hans game dictates, and break uh, this property. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we perform our analysis in a modular way. To do that, we abstract the underlying hardness notion and build uh, our analysis on top of it. We call this notion iterated search problems. Uh, these problems uh, should have the following properties. First, they should be hard, uh, similar to how we have defined iterated hardness for hash functions. Uh, they should be next problem simulatable in the sense that there exists a simulator that can uh, simulate uh, the next problem in a sequence without knowing the witness. They should be uh, witness malleable in the sense that there exists a program that can, that given a problem statement that a witness can generate another witness, cheaply. And they also have fast verification and guarantee a lower bound on the probability of success for honest miners. And now we have managed to uh, uh, instantiate this uh, primitive uh, using the three hash function properties I mentioned at the beginning. But the reason, the main reason we uh, build our analysis this way is to uh, help coming up uh, with other instantiations that we may not uh, imagine, uh, imagine right now. Concluding, uh, we have shown that assuming the existence of a hash function family that satisfies collision resistance uh, is a computational weak extractor and iterated hardness and a robust NIST proof system with appropriate parameters, there exists a protocol that implements a transaction ledger against an adversary that controls up to one third of the computational power. Moreover, in the process, uh, we've introduced a new hard problem notion called iterated search problems. And a number of questions uh, are left open uh, from our work. The first one is whether we can reduce iterated hardness to similar assumptions or more well studied assumptions. The second one is whether we can use techniques from cryptanalysis to attack the iterated hardness, hardness property of SAT of T6 squared or there are better, better uh, uh, hash functions suited for this property. And finally, uh, in the protocol level, uh, whether we can achieve uh, security against an adversary that controls uh, half of the computational power or close to half the computational power under the same assumptions. In other words, we want to see whether uh, witness malleability is a limiting factor uh, for, for security. Uh, in our analysis, uh, the reason we go up to one third is because we can only take advantage of one uh, adversarial block um, per uh, level of the block, block tree in, in our reduction shown earlier. Uh, that's all I wanted to say, so thank you all and take care.